Oh. Oops, that was my phone. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone coming in. We're just waiting for our audience to arrive. So hang on a couple of ticks. Hi everyone, we're just waiting for our audience to all arrive into the room, so give us a moment. <laughs> Kia ora tēnā koutou katoa and welcome everybody. We are starting a couple of minutes early because we have a really huge audience of people that are coming into today's session. So we thought we'd give you all plenty of time to arrive. So I'm going to do a little bit longer intro than I normally would do here to, to give everyone that uh, that moment to settle in. Hopefully you've got your cup of tea or your lunch or your donut uh, and are all ready to go. So um, my name is Rachel Froggett. I'm Chief Executive of Women Women in Sport Aotearoa and Secretary General of the International Working Group on Women in Sport. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, ourselves and our partners at the Trans-Tasman Business Circle are ridiculously excited about the guests that we have with us today. So if you are a Kiwi tuning in today, you will absolutely instantaneously recognise this person. Uh, and if you're one of our international audiences, too bad we've got her, you can't have her. Um, but we've definitely had this person uh, pretty much in everybody's living rooms uh, for the last six to eight weeks, uh, really breaking down and uh, explaining to us in really simple terms what on earth is going on, what this COVID-19 rubbish is and what we're supposed to do with it. Um, and has been an incredible uh, leader for us across New Zealand, uh, looking after us as we work our way through the lockdown periods. And as we approach, hopefully, what is going to be a move to level two next week, which is really significant for New Zealand, we thought it was an amazingly timely opportunity to have this person with us today. So a couple of bits of uh, housekeeping for you, those of you that have been with us before, you know that actually our moderator only asks questions for about 10 or 12 minutes and then we actually open the floor because we think it's an amazing opportunity for all of you to ask our guest speaker questions and all those burning things that you've wanted to know, uh, just get stuck in and ask uh, everything that you can. Uh, at the end of the session today, we will have a very short poll um, where we'll be asking you how you're feeling about life generally at the moment. Uh, it's just a really interesting bit of insight for us as we as we go forward. So uh, the last quick housekeeping thing I was going to say is for those of you who are uh, a bit eagle-eyed, you would remember that we were supposed to be staging the captain's lunch today, and it was supposed to be taking place at 1.30 p.m., uh, which is exactly now, uh, in the middle of Auckland, and we were going to have around 400 guests coming together at Eden Park uh, to celebrate women in sport and women in leadership. Um, 
And that event is very much still going ahead, not today, um, but hopefully we'll be coming back once we move to level two and level one uh, sometime around October, November. And we hope that everybody here will be coming along to that. So uh, very exciting. So I'm going to hand over to our moderator and also just give you one last little bit. Uh, we are going to be making a, an announcement on Monday about our next three weeks of speakers. Um, we've had such an, a massive reaction to the Leadership from Lockdown series that we are actually going to continue it for a few more weeks. So we've got three more speakers lined up um, and we'll talk about those on Monday. So without further ado, I'm going to hand across to our amazing moderator who returns again for week five, Ricky Swanell. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone, and, and welcome into some of the newcomers who are joining us for the first time. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm usually very much in the sports vein, so we'll be uh, extending out with our wonderful guest today, who is Associate Professor Susie Wiles. Basically, everybody's uh, Auntie Susie, I think, has become at the moment um, in New Zealand. Thank you so much. And I guess, first of all, you have spent the last two months basically looking after all of us. So how are you? <laughs> I'm I'm well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a, whoa, a roller coaster ride for all of us, hasn't it? Um, and I've had really days that have been down in the dumps, and then I've had days where uh, the sun is shining and I'm feeling okay. So um, yeah, I think just like everybody, we're we're tired mentally and physically. You know, I've I've heard this. Um, you know, we're all working from home, and it's like no, we're not. We're at home in a global emergency, trying to do some work, juggling 101 things, and so. Yeah, I think every feeling that everybody has is completely legitimate. You know, if you're not coping, that's absolutely normal. <laughs> One hundred percent for sure. I mean, we've come to to know you um, over the last wee while on our TV screens and in the media. But tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into science? What was your pathway into microbiology? Well, so um, I am, uh, gosh, I'm originally from the UK, um, and uh, but I married a Kiwi, and so I moved here about uh, nearly 11 years ago now. Um, but how did I get into uh, microbiology? So I wasn't, I wasn't a traditional like sciencey kid. I mean, I loved Lego, um, and uh, I actually I was, I was a swimmer at school. So I, I grew up in South Africa. My teenage years were in South Africa, and I did a lot of swimming. Um, but then and we had a pool and so I swam every day and then it was funny when we moved to England uh, there was no more swimming <laughs> um, and so I, um, I yeah what did I get into I, I sort of started reading I was always a big reader and I started reading a lot more stuff and as a teenager I, I guess I had a bit of a doom and gloom period that sort of probably coincided with us leaving South Africa and I started reading lots of books about uh, death and um, and I got given this book called The Fireside Book of Deadly Diseases. And it was just fascinating. The, 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 it was just oh, tuberculosis, cholera, plague, all of these incredible diseases. Um, and I just was so struck by how these tiny organisms, you know, can wreak havoc both with our bodies and our lives. Um, and it, it, you know, I was struck by that book as to how they can change the course of our history. And, and we're living through that right now. And I guess I never really thought I would actually live through something like this. Um, yeah, so I got interested in it. I was, I had an amazing biology teacher at school. Um, and so I ended up, and then parents who had left um, school quite young and so were very keen for me to go to university. And so I went off to university to do biology. And I just, I absolutely loved, again, uh, going to those lectures and listening about infectious diseases. And so that ended up being what I specialized in. But I still had no real idea of science as a career. So while I was doing my undergraduate degree, that was when um, my lecturers started to go, oh, you're quite clever. Perhaps you could do a PhD. And I had no idea what a PhD was. So like somebody explained it. Um, and then I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. Um, and so I never really knew this was a career until, until, until I was kind of in it. And then and now I look back and go, oh yeah, okay. So that's, <laughs> that's what I did. Cause I didn't, you know, my, my, I was going to be the first person in my family to go to university. Um, what ended up happening was my dad decided he'd go as well. And he ended up beating me by a year. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was a really, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have, I didn't know anything about academia. Didn't know, really know much about, um, 
you know, science as a profession, I guess. I didn't really know anybody like that. Um, but it just was about following the thing that I really loved and having the opportunities to follow that, that that's ended up leading me where to, I, I am today. It's been amazing, really. Oh, very privileged. Such an advertisement for the power of reading. Everyone take <laughs> note, clip this bit off and give it to your kids right now. Um, if we go back to when we, we first started to hear about COVID-19 and, and the seriousness of the situation, can you remember if you, your two parts of your life? What does Susie, the microbiologist, think, but then the private individual think? Well, I don't think there are two bits of me. <laughs> I'm always a microbiologist. Um, so I had actually, so I spent the, um, Christmas in the UK. Uh, so my daughter and I went over, we left um, uh, my husband behind. He didn't want to come to the cold. So we went off and we spent uh, a month hanging out with friends and family. And we came back to New Zealand via Hong Kong, actually, um, just as things were kicking off. So kind of mid-January. Uh, um, and I sort of got home and a few days later got a, my first call saying, uh, can you come on to Breakfast TV and talk about this um, this virus? And so I was like, oh, I sort of heard about this and I started doing some reading and it was like, okay, there's this thing that's happening, kind of looks a bit scary, but you know, there's no reason for panic uh, at the moment. I mean, not that there's, uh, my thing, I guess the, the, way, the way that I have tried to talk to people about this is that when you panic, you don't act in your best interest or in anybody's best interest. So it's always been, how concerned am I about this, but please don't panic type thing. So in mid January, it was like, mm, this is kind of interesting, but at the moment there's nothing that would ring huge alert bells. And then about two weeks later, I went back on breakfast and it was like, wow, this is escalating fast. <laughs> and it's been so interesting because lots of people have really struggled with that. You know, I've had emails from people going, but you said it was going to be okay. And I was like, well, my job as a scientist is to look at what the evidence is and then change my opinion as the evidence changes. And, you know, what everybody is watching is how science happens, like in fast forward almost, you know, that, that we, um, as more stuff comes in, we can go, yeah, okay, now we're, now we're quite scared. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In, that, in that sense then, I mean, you've, you've been such a, an authoritative voice and you've taken that on right from the start. So were you prepared to take on that role as you realised this was escalating? Yeah, so I guess the important thing to say is that this is not my first rodeo. So um, as, a, as a microbiologist, um, I, and so I've been here, as I say, nearly, uh, nearly 11 years now, um, and I've always had an interest in sort of science communication. And part of that is because my job as a publicly funded scientist, I, I believe, is to make sure that um, people know, you know, what I do, that I can justify what I do, but also that if my skills are necessary and needed, that I will step up and, you know, explain stuff. So I have, um, gosh, I mean, so it started about 10 years ago when there was a big outbreak of food poisoning in Germany. And so I ended up doing my very first interview um, about that. I got called sushi on live TV, which was quite funny. Um, then uh, I've done Ebola, I've done Zika, you know, I did the Fonterra botulism scare. So basically over the last 10 years, I have developed the skills that are needed that when a microbiology type story and infectious diseases stories in the news, I can explain it to everybody that needs to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was probably one of the first reasons why I got that call going, okay, there's this thing. Um, and it just, I guess I had no idea that it would end up becoming my life. So I basically had to put my real job aside um, and focus on this. And, and it was because I made a conscious decision that this was more important at the moment for me to focus my attention on because the, it's changing so fast and it has had such a huge con you know, consequences for all of us that I really felt that it was important for me to step up so that to explain why we were being asked to do the things that we were going to be asked to do so that people really understood you know, what were, what was needed of us all? Because, you know, the premise is right. This has been a, you know, New Zealand has been a team of 5 million, right? I mean, this is how we respond to this virus is all about our, our as working individually for the collective. Um, and so that's, that was just something that was kind of, I never even thought for a minute that I wouldn't do it. Um, because I knew that I had, you know, this is my area of expertise. And I spent the last 10 years kind of learning how to talk to people, you know, responding to journalists' questions, uh, doing all sorts of things and thinking, okay, yeah. So in many respects, I feel like I've been training for this for 10 years and then this is the moment where it's needed. And I, and I had no idea this is what I was actually training for, I guess. But you, like, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you'd largely do this, the, all this media stuff you're doing basically unpaid out of the goodness of your heart to get that message across and help New Zealanders. 
Uh, yes, I, I mean, I guess so. I mean, you know, again, as a university academic, um, I have a portion of my time that is supposed to be spent in what we call service. Um, and so that is sort of like, that is service to my community and uh, in my scientific community. So there's things that I do, like I'm a journal editor and all of these sorts of things. But I consider this uh, communication part of that service. So it's just gone from a small portion of my job to being actually, no, I just need to do this all the time. Um, and it, it, you know, it's been, um, it, oh, it's just been amazing. Um, the, I guess the other thing that happened, uh, so I, I, can't, I don't, don't even know how long ago now, it feels like forever, but um, so I've always been, I've, I've worked with animators and cartoonists and all sorts of things before in the past to do, just to sort of communicate stuff about microbiology. Um, and so, I was writing a lot and, you know, responding to journalists' um, queries and things. And something came up where I thought um, a visual aid would be really useful. Uh, and so this basically started a relationship with um, the cartoonist from the spinoff called Toby Morris. And now Toby and I just are working together on all sorts of things. It'll be like, hey, we need to learn, you know, I think people need to know about this. Let's figure out how we can communicate that. And so I'll do sort of some written piece. And together, Toby and I will figure out you know, he, he brings the, how do you make that visual? Um, and it's just been the most amazing thing to see those graphics that we've made go all around the world. We've got, there are people online who are translating them into every language. Um, and I get emails all the time going, oh, we're using your thing. And it's, you know, and it's saving lives. And it's sort of, it's quite overwhelming actually that, that we kind of get together, put our heads together and go, okay, this is the important thing. And then the next thing you know, somebody in, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think, where, Tur somebody in Turkey is like, yep, and here it is in Turkish. And it's like, wow. Yeah. So cool, so cool. Yeah, really amazing. Isn't it though? I mean, it's kind of, it's put you in the eye of the storm a little bit and I can um, read your out of office message that you have on is if you're emailing to tell me you don't agree with me and you do so in an unkind and threatening way, then please take some time to think about why you thought it appropriate to email me. That's just the, the small version. And I think particularly for a lot of the women who are on here who are in public positions, we've been on the end of that. How do you, how have you coped with the inevitable keyboard warriors, the trolls and those kind of people? Um. Well, I have days where I don't cope. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have days where I pull on my big girl pants and I'm like, got to do this, right? Because I know they're a minority. So um, for me, it's taken all sorts of forms. So it's been people who, um, are, who don't, who, well, um, people who don't have the same value set as me. And so they're like, you're making these decisions and we don't like them. And you're making this advice and we don't like it. Um, and so they're kind of very firmly going, this is, this is not, you know, we don't like you and we don't like what you stand for. Um, there's, and then there's been people who, um, have, so one big thing has been about mask wearing. And so there are people who are really vehemently, like we all need to be wearing masks all the time. Uh, and so they have started threatening me about that because I won't, I haven't stepped up and said, yes, you're right, everyone should wear a mask because it's actually a bit more, I mean, it's more complicated than that. This is the problem with stuff like this. Um, and that actually culminated in somebody making an official complaint to the university about me. Um, so there's been kind of that stuff going on. I, I, I'm almost tempted to show you the email that I just got before I oh. turned this on, but it's, it's a bit, I mean, it's very short and succinct. So do you, want, do you want to see yeah, it? Go on. Go on. See if you can read that. Can you read that? Oh, go back. Oh, yes. I hope everyone can see that. Yeah. That was today's email. Lovely. <laughs> Short and sweet. I don't know what I've done to upset him, but um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it is, it is astonishing how much more this, you know, women get this, you know, there are lots of, um, lots of men who step up and they don't get this kind of abuse. Um, but I just have to remind myself, of course, that there I'm getting lots of emails, from, lovely emails from people going, you know, we just love seeing you out there. And, um, and just also people who, who say, you know, you're inspiring me to do science or you're inspiring me to step up and sort of, you know, stand up for what I believe in. And so, yeah, as I say, I just have to put my big girl pants on and, and I often have a little bit of a cry, but... Um, <laughs> so we all. For those who couldn't see and they did ask what was on the email, it just simply said one word, idiot, which um, we know... Oh, that was, that was the... That was, oh, so no, that the was idiot the subject was line. The, it, was the idiot was the subject line. Yeah, uh, so... I couldn't see what the, what the other word oh, was under okay. was. <laughs> but but okay. if it's not uh, readable, but anyway, I think we get, we get the gist yeah. of um, that charming fellow's... Um, he called me some nasty names. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
we'll move on. We'll, we'll look, um, and I know we're just starting to get conscious of time already. We'll look at the, some of the sports stuff and specifically, obviously, at level three, we saw golf and tennis come back and now the changes are going to come at level two. So what does that mean for sport? It's going to open things up a little bit more, but how can our sports facilities, organisations be really ready for, the, for what's coming um, over the next wee while? Yeah, so um, I guess the, so level two is all about the kind of keep it safe. And my hope would be that we could be at level two for a fairly short period of time. If we are basically really confident the virus is eliminated here, we could move out of that. So it is going to be just about um, how can you do things as safely as possible so that if there was a, a little mini outbreak, it could be squashed as soon as possible. And so that, that will be again about kind of being in bubbles, about keeping those as small as possible. Um, and knowing who everybody is and, and who they're having contact with. Because the thing that has been most difficult about this virus is the fact that people are infectious for a few days before they develop symptoms. Uh, and some people develop really mild symptoms that they kind of just go, oh, well, that's not really it, that's something else, right? And so it's so crucial because when you don't know that you're infectious, you know, depending on what you do and how much contact you have with somebody or lots of people, you could spread it quite far. So it's all going to be about, um, so yeah, so for example, teams, well, if you're going to start training together, you know, can you do it in bubbles? Can you say, okay, well, these are the people who are going to stay together, you know, you can make those bigger, but frankly, the bigger they are, the more risk there is. And then obviously if people within that training bubble are all going off and then having, you know, doing other things with other people, you know, you can see that something that, that's maybe 50 people big suddenly becomes 500, right? Which becomes much more difficult to manage. I and mean, it's also gonna be all about these, um, so maintaining the hand washing um, and all of the kind of cleaning of things. So again, shared surfaces, what, it is, what is your sport? Where are you working out or where are you training? Where are you playing and what does it require? Does it require people to be using the same stuff? Because if they can't be cleaned, then that's going to be uh, it's going to be tricky, right? So, um, and there are there are ways of doing things, um, but it just might require a bit of um, you know thinking or getting the right kind of kit to make sure that things can be um, cleaned and sanitized between uh, people. Um, but yeah, it really is about uh, we just we uh, we just don't you know we want to be rid of this virus here, right? Mm -hmm. We want to be getting back to some kind of semblance of normal. Um, and so my, my guess, I just want to urge everyone to, to realize it's so important that we do this sort of slowly, because if we don't and we see cases come back, then we are basically back where we started. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and it's just because, you know, because people are infectious, before they know it. And also because there's an incubation period. So it takes sort of two to 10 days for somebody to come down with the virus. Um, and that means that, you know, what happens, you know, if we see a case today, it's something that reflects what happened a couple of weeks ago. And so we've got, we're always running behind. It's like basically chasing something, you know, uh, from meters apart with blindfold on. You just, we, you know, so we're, we're always trying to play catch up. And that's why it's our job to try and do the best we can to minimize the chances of it coming back. Because in Australia, you know, there's, there's now in, in, uh, in Melbourne, they've got a, another big cluster that's just kind of exploded. And it's really, it's had like 49 cases in the last few days just in one workplace. And so they're, 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 those are people who got infected within the last two weeks. So how far is that already spread before you even realize it's spread? Um, so yeah, play it safe. Because the more we do that, the quicker we can move out of these restrictions too. On that, and this is, is quite a specific question that I think has implications for our sports teams and the facilities, and it's um, the time frame of being exposed to COVID-19 and testing positive. So if, if you're exposed to somebody who has the virus, should you be tested within 24 hours or do you actually need to wait a couple of days? You possibly need to wait up to 10 days. I mean, that's what's really difficult because depending on who you are, you might be in, you know, you might be in the two day incubation period or you might be in the 10 day incubation right. period. So over that time, the virus will start to um, do its thing. Uh, and then the question is, at what stage does it be, do you become, um, you know, detectable? So there may well end up being um, a scenario where uh, there's an easy test that could be done every day. Um, you know, with that, what, again, what you're watching is science on steroids, right? I mean, what we are watching is a virus we've never seen before that has emerged and we now know like huge amounts about it. I mean, still 
not as much as we'd like to know, but you know, compared, compared to not knowing anything in the space of four months or five months, we've gone from nothing to actual clinical trials and diagnostics and drugs and you know, all sorts of things. So the, the, how the test has evolved over that time um, is, is changed. Uh, and there are lots of, um, so at the moment it is a, you know, you need one of these horrible nasal swabs uh, and that goes off to a lab. But there are a few companies who are starting to release, um, uh, you know, basically what we call point of care. So tests that can be done like by you at home. They're not fantastic yet, but in the next couple of months, we could have something that you could, that everybody could, you know, could test themselves every few days if that was, you know, if that was actually important for your business. Um, so it's, it's not a, it, what's, the problem with the kind of exposure thing is it usually takes time for you to realize you've been exposed. Um, and it's not just a case of, oh, the next day I'll go and get tested because that will be too early to, to really tell anything. But then the problem is when you wake from symptoms, it's kind of too late. So um, it's really complicated. Um, but as I say, it may well be that these tests kind of come online at some point, because obviously this is a big thing everywhere. And so those tests are being kind of pushed, you know, I mean, the scientists are working incredibly hard to try and develop these things. The question is how reliable are they and whether they're going to pick, you know, whether you end up um, with a false sense of security because you test negative and then you're like, oh, I'm fine. Whereas actually you might just be the day before sort of thing. So um, yeah, that's what sort of makes this all so tricky. And I, I do feel like everybody's learning so much more about how science works. <laughs> Sure. All I know is that I 100% do not even want to have to have one of those fobs jammed up my nose. So, well, the great, um, the great thing uh, now is that, um, so there's just been a, a couple of papers released showing actually that you can potentially do it from sputum and spit. Oh. So it may well be that early in the morning when you're a bit kind of, blah, yeah. you can, you know, it, it, it took about half a cup's worth of spit, but that may well be the way to do it. So it could become a morning, okay, I'll get, I'll get tested, but... Um, for most of us, I mean, the, what we're aiming for in New Zealand is to not have that be a reality, right? <laughs> sure. I'll get to some of the questions that are coming in here. Um, this is very sport specific, but do you think that it was the right decision to let the Warriors join the NRL this season, given the border close, closures? And I guess that's probably seen as one rule for that sport and, and something different for everybody else. Yeah, I'm, oh, yeah, there there have been that, haven't there? There's been lots of rules for some people and not for others. I mean, the I guess they have they're not going to be coming back though, right? They've gone to at, train. At, yeah, as it stands, and at at this stage, yeah, they won't come back unless. Yeah, I mean, we right until there's a Trans Tasman bubble, well, there yeah. are going to be restrictions on people's travel. So, um, they've gone. Um, I mean, I guess people can still go away, but when you come back, you have to be quarantined, right? So um, what they've done, though, essentially, as a team, is is potentially put themselves at risk, depending on where they've gone and what the what you know what the what's happening there. Um, I'm not quite as I, as I say in Melbourne. There's now a splurge of cases, so uh, it's not the kind of thing that I would be recommending any team do. You know, we're in this for the long haul, right? I know that everybody's really keen for us to get back to normal. There is no normal after this. We're going to be in a really different world. And the question is, how are we going to work through that? Um, and and so trying to, yeah, it's, oh God, it's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. hard. Um, how does the university support you in the communications? And, and do you feel that the university is doing enough to look after yourself and colleagues who are at the front and center of this? Oh, can I have a no comment? <laughs> I wonder if that's uh, um, enough of a comment. Yes. Um, no, that's that's a, that's mean. So um, it's I've got some incredibly supportive colleagues, um, and uh, I, I'm I'm kind of in a weird position where I'm kind of between two faculties, one of which. Uh, some colleagues are not particularly supportive and then the others of which are just like awesome people. So I remember in those early days, you know, I, um, I had colleagues who were sending me flowers and cakes and all sorts of things. And yet I'd never heard anything from any of my bosses. So it's just been a weird thing where I have, again, like everything, you have people who don't value what you do and then you have people you do. So um, yeah, I have lots of people who are looking after me and I wouldn't have been able to do this without them. Um, but it's been really interesting to watch who has said nothing. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, yeah. Um, what would be, I guess, your top three messages to sports organizers, and this is across the spectrum, who are trying to get their competitions ready, how to communicate these messages to their sports communities? Um, I guess my first message is, 
I know this is hard, but we have to take it slow. So please, what I guess the, so my big plea is, you know, in New Zealand and Australia is the same, like sports people are heroes to everybody. You are role models to everybody. And so when you break the rules, you show that it's okay to break the rules, right? I mean, we've seen this with people going off and training, going, oh, you know, didn't really mean to. It's like, it matters. And so what I want to see from sports is real leadership. That is kind of, we are going to follow the rules and we're not going to pressure to do things to move before we're ready, that we're going to trust the science and the health experts that they have our best interests at heart. Um, and, you know, and we're going to do what we're asked to do. And so that is for the next little while to play it safe you know, to be not pressuring to open up and do things that, that the health people are saying, please don't, because when you start pressuring, then everybody else is going, well, why can't we do it, right? And then it all just falls apart because this is so important that we remain that cohesive team, which again, as sports people, you know, right? <laughs> so you can teach us how to do that well. So um, yeah, I think it's just, you know, be thinking about what does this look like? What are the risks for, for depending on what your sport is how do people interact with each other? How can you um, do physical distancing if that's possible? If you can't, what does that look like? How would you minimize the number of people who are together in case something happened? And, and think of that, about that in a sort of worst case scenario. I think it's also really clear that um, it's going to be a long time before people feel confident about being in crowds again. Mm. So, you know, the other thing we've learned from this is we can do things really differently really differently, right? I mean, how many more people will be willing to work from home now? You know, not every day, but you know, some days. Um, I've just, I've loved going to gigs in my pajamas, right? Because bands have played from their bubbles. So I think we need to get creative as well. Um, because actually the other thing that, that, that being at home has taught a lot of us is that it's more accessible sometimes for, you know, people who couldn't normally get to a venue might suddenly now have access because they can watch things and stuff. So I think um, don't be too, move too fast to want to open things up, especially to the public, um, because that is a big risk. Uh, and, and I ask you to, to show leadership in this space, to, to basically say, we're gonna follow the scientists and the health um, experts, because they, this is their turf, right? <laughs> and that they are trying to act in everybody's best interests. Um, and when, when people that the public really value start to push then um that's then then people stop listening to us yeah i guess it's all those same messages and the hand the hand hygiene the sneezing into into the none of those things change just because the, the things are getting looser there's a question here um there's been an opinion that the virus has a 70 day life cycle and peaks at about 40 days 40 to 45 um have you got a, a opinion on this uh that doesn't match with anything I've seen. <laughs> one, of the, one of the tricky things is that um, people test positive for a long time after they have basically finished having symptoms. Um, and so the, the worry at first was, well, does this mean that they still have the virus? Um, but the, the test for the virus itself is not able to differentiate between viable infectious virus and bits of gunky virus that you're basically your body is destroyed. Um, and so um, in Korea, then South Korea, they've basically been following hundreds of people um, who've still been testing positive and they have not been able to get a single live virus out of those tests. So we think it's because the test is just picking up the bits of crud that your, your body's been dealing with. So yeah, it, and, and there was another really good study that actually looked at when people were infectious. And again, they showed that if, um, if people only had contact with somebody who had the virus, um, after they had had the virus, after they had symptoms for six days, none of those people got infected. So um, it really, yeah, that sounds like absolute nonsense to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're probably going to see in the next wee while is sports events behind closed doors. And the question is, is do you think that is realistic, even without a crowd, still considering the number of people that it does take to manage an event in a stadium, um, in addition to all the people who are participating or broadcasting or, and all of that? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it's, it needs to be kept as small as possible, right? So what is the minimum number of people you can get away with? And again, doing it in teams and bubbles. So um, can you, rather than everybody has to come into contact with everybody else, how can you make sure that people are only coming into con close contact with smaller groups of people? I think it is completely, you know, it is manageable. Um, and it is just also about knowing who has contacted with who. Um, so if, if teams are interacting, 
then knowing exactly when, when that was and who they were will help with contact tracing if that's needed. Yeah, because I guess, and this follows on a little bit, um, we're going to see contact sport resuming. So rather large burly men putting their heads in places they <laughs> for their sport, um, which is a big jump from level three. So uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it, it, there is an inherent risk in all this contact. And so I guess it's about balancing seeing the so what what is the risk of getting the virus and, and you know given we're on this elimination path we would hope that risk would be very low and um, versus what are the consequences for those particular people and so we would hope that it would be low consequences mm -hmm. but um i guess the thing that that we are learning now about this virus because there have been so many people infected is that there can be severe consequences for people that you wouldn't have expected um, but these are very rare events so we haven't seen them in new zealand but for example there's been some papers just published about um uh, some uh, so doctors in New York, but I think also in Italy and maybe in the Netherlands, who have seen young, well, yeah, thirties to forties, perfectly healthy people suddenly have strokes, really severe strokes, um, and these people have all tested positive for COVID nineteen. They were basically at home with a mild infection, and then suddenly, you know, a few weeks later, they suddenly have a stroke. So this is why we don't want it here, right? It's why we went down the elimination path because we didn't know what the long-term consequences or, or what the rare consequences were. Um, and so that's why kind of balancing these things is really important. You know, if it is going to be this sort of contact, then again, it's all about how can you minimize the number of people you have that contact with. Um, so this may well be um, changing schedules of games, actually. So, you know, you if it's, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a scientist, I'm pretty bloody bad at sport but like how many people are in a team so how many people would if you were playing another team how many people would that be contact like doing that physical contact so for rugby you've got 50 uh, 30 on the on the field plus another so squads of 23 basically um, okay. netball, netball you're looking at squads of 12 so for the okay so netball would be better than rugby <laughs> <laughs> because it's a smaller number of people, obviously, yeah. Um, but so, you know, 23, so that's 46 people. It's just the point. Potentially having this close contact. So if they have a game and then a week later have another game, that's, so they've had, you know, they've had contact with 23 then and they've had contact with another 23 who've maybe had contact with another 23. And then it just becomes completely unmanageable. So it may well end up being that thinking about the fixtures and how you can make sure that there are sufficient gaps that if there is, a, if there is an outbreak, it doesn't wipe through the entire um, league or whatever it is, you know, that's, those are going to be the really important things to think about. The slight change of tack. How how have you stayed so positive and sane through this? Through oh. the ups and downs and the good days and the bad days and the horrible emails and things. Um, it's partly where we are. So it's partly a um, we are in a country that is doing elimination and doing it really well. That's been, or well, we hope really well. I mean, we don't quite know how good level three has been yet. We'll find that out in a few days' time. But um, and because it's been really hard. So as I say, I'm from the UK. My parents are in the UK. Um, my mum is uh, somebody who got a letter from the NHS to say she was a vulnerable person. And so she had to stay home for the next few months, you know. Um, and so when Boris Johnson said, you know, this is our strategy and uh, his very words were, every family should expect to lose loved ones before their time. Um, I cried that day. I was like, oh my God. So I was trying to maintain this positive, hey, we shouldn't panic and we should work together while really worried about my mum and dad. I'm still worried about my mum and dad. I mean, they're, they're being very sensible, but um, yeah, so it's, so that's, so I guess just knowing that I have to be positive and that I have to, um, that my, that I have a job to do. And if I fall apart, I can't do that job. So that has been one of the things that has kept me going. Um, and I've got an amazing supportive little bubble. You know, my, my husband and my daughter and I, two cats, um, not that they're particularly supportive, but you know, so I, I couldn't do what I do if it wasn't for the people around me who were lifting me up and, and, you know, and, wiping the tears away when they come and feeding me chocolate cake and doing those kinds of things. So, um, because all of us, you know, we're not little islands. We, we are um, social beings and, and we do need these people to support us. So that's kind of how I've done it. But it has been knowing that I have a job to do um, and it was an important job because I've, I've, heard, I've also had, um, I've had journalists who are, who've called up to, to talk about something and they've just said, oh, just, I just want 
nice to hear your voice. <laughs> You've made me feel really calm already. <laughs> oh, that's very sweet. So there's also been something I think about the decision to do, um, to try and show the human me and that I have, that I'm worried, but I don't want us to panic. Um, but something about that has calmed people and helped them kind of get through it. And so um, I'm, you know, immensely grateful, privileged to have had that role. Um, I'm really glad it's helped some people. It's obviously made some people a bit cross, but um, I, I can cope with that. <laughs> This is a, a diff different question, and it's an important one, I think. One in four New Zealanders identify as disabled. Many have underlying health conditions, which may or may not put them at greater risk of COVID. So how do we ensure these members of our community aren't marginalised further by this virus um, and by, I guess, other people's perception of what they think a disabled person can or can't do? And, and this is one of the underlying reasons why I was so against the kind of so-called plan B, the idea that we could just isolate anybody who was supposedly vulnerable for the foreseeable future. I mean, that's just, it's so offensive on so many different levels. I mean, it is assuming that anybody, you know, that, well, it's assuming A, that you can do it. <laughs> which uh, Sweden has shown you can't, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just, it's completely misunderstanding, you know, who is vulnerable, how many of those people we have in New Zealand, they say it's a lot of people, but it's, it's even assuming that those people are not, are not fulfilling incredible lives right now. So, um, yeah, that was why I was so grateful that we went down this path um, rather than the, uh, the sort of the idea with that we would just slow it down so it didn't overwhelm our health you know, system. It's like, no, we don't want anyone to get sick because that's just, oh, it's horrible. And I, 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 just, I still struggle with this because people are still sending me, you know, oh, the death rate looks like so-and-so. You do, you, you know, are you going to apologize that we overreacted? It's just like any death rate is, oh, anyway. Yeah, don't get me started. I just don't, <laughs> I don't understand this. Um, and I think the vast majority of New Zealanders or the people who support these sort of things, I don't think they even realize who, who it is, you know. Um, and yeah, I still, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of a, um, a, um, of a, a line from the movie Shrek. So Lord Farquaad, uh, is basically sending out his people to go and on and do some stuff. And he says, um, uh, many of you will die, but that is a sacrifice I am willing to make. And I'm just like, yeah, that's, that's kind of, in some respects, that's how people have been acting and it's so offensive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, on vaccine situation, um, what are your views on the vaccine? Will they be effective or is this going to be part of our lives? And then there's sort of a second question about it, the possibility of it die, the virus dying out on a global scale. Okay, so um, from what I can remember, there are about 30 odd different um, potential vaccines in various stages of development. Um, I can't imagine that one of them wouldn't be successful, but who knows? I mean, we're just gonna have to watch the space. Um, viruses are much easier to make vaccines for than, than bacteria, so that makes me hopeful. Um, and the fact that there is so much going on in the space makes me hopeful. The really important thing is going to be that it, is, um, that it isn't rushed so that we don't get something that doesn't work or that, it, or that is actually dangerous. Um, uh, and that if something, when something is developed, that it is available, that it is not out of the out of the price range of, of you know of, of everybody. And so the other thing that people are watching now is also there's been some really horrendous stuff happening, um, just showing what happens when you make health a for profit business, uh, and it just shouldn't be like that. So um, that those are the things that I'm more worried about is not whether one will be developed, but whether it will be equitably um, you know released and available to everybody who needs it. Um, we, I'm conscious of time because Sharon's popped up, which means we're just about running out of time. So there's just a couple, I guess, um, quick around sports and facilities because a lot of our sports facilities are older. They've got, you know, old, old public loos and no drying facilities, things like that. And obviously equipment, how long the virus lasts on that. So what would you advise it to be really important for community sports who might have limited funds to make things safe enough? Is this safe? Yeah. Yes, safe enough. <laughs> Option. Again, our, our aim is to not have the virus around. So that's, that's, the, that's what we're going for, in which case it will be very safe to do stuff. And washing hands is going to be the important thing uh, and disinfecting surfaces and things like that. So the virus stays on um, kind of plastics and metals for probably about three days. 
Um, so, but you know, can be really easily got rid of through disinfectants and things like that. So it's going to be the thing that's really boring, which is the cleaning and stuff. Yes. Um, but you know, isn't that interesting that what this virus, what this pandemic has shown us is who are the essential workers? The essential workers are the cleaners. They are the people, you know, working in supermarkets. And so I would also hope that what we come out of this where there's a really new sense of who is valuable in our society and that we should pay them accordingly. And just quickly, is that would that be the same on like a, a netball or a basketball or a rugby ball? That's a slightly different kind of surface, I guess, or, or um, material? Yeah, so not clear. I mean, those, um, so... I think cardboard was probably the closest thing to it, which I think was 24 hours, but it certainly didn't look like it would be more than that kind of time. I mean, plastic, I guess some balls are sort of plasticky, aren't they? So probably three days. But again, really easy to just give a, a disinfectant over after everybody's done it or give or have them all balls in quarantine, stick them in quarantine for three days. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I'm so sorry, everybody. I see so many great questions here that I haven't had a chance to get to, but um, thank you. Dr. Susie for everything and um, I'll hand back over to Sharon and then we'll get a few final thoughts from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Ricky and yes thank you Susie. You are so cool. It was so neat to have you with us today. I loved it and we've had amazing feedback already coming through. Um, I'll formally thank you in a moment but for those of you who are regulars with us you'll see the poll coming up in front of you and if you wouldn't mind answering those questions and we'll give you the the results um, at the end. But yes, Susie, thank you so much. You covered so much about your personal journey through this, which is fascinating in itself. Um, the, the, the virus itself, sports, um, you know, acknowledging that you don't know a lot about sports, so you did really well on that. So thank you so much. Ricky, always a pleasure to have you with us as well again. Brilliant to have you back this week. Um, and I wanted to thank Rachel and the team at Women in Sport Aotearoa for bringing this series to us. Um, so thank you to those of you who have answered the poll. They are up in front of you now. So excellent. Most of us are still feeling innovative. Um, brilliant. 95% of us believe the government is doing a good job. Uh, for the planning, most of us think 12 months is an estimate of when this will be over. And 61% thinking that women and girls will have a, um, a part to play in business recovery, which is amazing. So thank you so much again to everyone for joining us. And Susie, I'll hand over to you for the closing comments. Uh, yes, gosh, what can I say? Um, I certainly never thought that I would be living through a global pandemic as I think um, many of us didn't. So I think just take the time to pat yourselves on the back for how, how you've done, regardless of how that is. You know, if all you need to do is sit and watch Netflix and eat popcorn, that's absolutely fine. I mean, whatever, however you're behaving in this is kind of okay for you. Um, and we will get through this, um, but we need to take it slowly. Uh, and as sports people, you know, and as people in this industry, um, people like me are relying on you to, to help um, show that the science is important and that we follow the, follow the science and follow the, the health. So thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you.